Well, I'll get started then. Thank you very much, Lang, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here today. I appreciate your time. Um, and don't feel bad about the uh, time zone. I uh, just uh, had a son born to me about uh, five days ago, so whether it's 9 a.m. or 9 p.m. or 3 a.m., it doesn't really make a difference to me. I'm going to be exhausted anyways. So uh, hopefully I'll uh, be coherent enough to give this presentation. Um, in any case, this is uh, an overview of what I plan to speak about uh, today. Uh, just briefly, I'll talk about who we are, who Saverin is, and how it fits in with Geosyntec. I'll then go in to describe the science behind the technologies that we offer, which is smoldering combustion. Uh, I'll then talk about our solutions, uh, Star X and Star, and how we typically apply these things. And then I'll move into some case studies. Uh, for Star X, I'll talk about two of our different systems, um, reactor systems and soil power systems, which have uh, been developed with a partner in the oil and gas industry, um, focusing actually on some work we're doing uh, in Australia. Um, and then I'll go on to describe the in-situ process, which we call STAR, and again, I'll use a case study uh, for a site in New Jersey for which we are currently conducting full-scale remediation. So who are we? Well, Savern is a division of Geosyntec Consultants. Um, as Lang said, Geosyntec is all about technology innovation, um, and Savron uh, has been uh, separated as a division within Geosyntec so that we can operate not as consultants but really as a technology provider uh, for your consulting needs. Of course, uh, Lang is always there. Um, but we uh, identify ourselves separately because what we're all about is providing waste management and remediation solutions, uh, and, and these solutions are based on smoldering combustion. In essence, Savern is there to provide the STAR and the STAR X technology. So let's talk about smolder and combustion so we all have a good understanding of what this really is. Uh, as I mentioned, STAR and STAR X are based on the principles of smolder and combustion. There, there are essentially two types of combustion, flaming combustion and smolder and combustion. And most people are more familiar with flaming combustion because that's what they see in their fireplace uh, or with a candle uh, when you see a, a flame dancing above a fuel source. Uh, smoldering combustion is a fundamentally different process, and an example of this is when you have a charcoal briquette in your barbecue glowing red hot without flames. That is a smoldering combustion reaction. And the reason you have smoldering as opposed to flaming in that example is because you have a porous matrix uh, and a slow-burning uh, fuel. Um, the porous matrix that we have when we're applying STAR or STAR X as a remediation solution is the contaminated soils that we are trying to remediate. Uh, in any case, uh, combustion reactions are exothermic reactions which simply convert carbon compounds to CO2 and water. And we typically describe combustion through the use of a combustion triangle. A combustion triangle essentially says these are the three things you need to have at the same place at the same time in order to get a combustion reaction to occur. Uh, the first thing you need is a fuel. Now, for us, this is a simple thing. Uh, this is the contaminated soils that we're trying to remediate it, so it's, it's remediate, so this is the target of our remediation efforts. Uh, the second thing you need to bring into the combustion triangle is an oxidant. For us, we simply use the oxygen that naturally occurs in air. So we blow a lot of air around. We either inject it into the ground for STAR or we blow it in a reactor system for STAR X. The third element we need in our combustion triangle is heat. Now, in order to get the process started, we supply that heat. For example, with the STAR process, we'll install a heater into an ignition well, and we'll, we'll turn that on for a period of time to get the combustion reaction going. But well, once the combustion reaction starts, recall it is an exothermic reaction. It gives off heat. And so once it's ignited, we end up using the heat of the combustion reaction to supply the heat element of the combustion triangle. When we enter this phase where we're not supplying the heat, but rather the contaminants that are combusting are supplying heat, we're entering a self-sustained combustion mode. And self-sustaining combustion is really the whole trick to STAR and STAR X. It's at this stage where we're not supplying external, external energy and we're making use of the energy inherent in the contaminants we're trying to destroy. Uh, so unlike other thermal technologies which rely on endothermic processes like pyrolysis and volatilization, for example, uh, which require energy input into the system. Our process is exothermic, so we're making use of the energy that the contaminants have already. 
Well, this is a little video here which shows uh, smoldering combustion in action. This was a uh, column experiment which was taken by webcam uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, just to set it up, you see the photograph on the left-hand side. It's a 10-centimeter diameter column with the, the black zone there is 15-centimeter uh, uh, packing of coal tar mixed with coarse sand. At the bottom of this uh, cylinder, uh, at the bottom of, sorry, the black uh, coal tar zone, we have a heating element and we have an air supply. The heating element is used to get the process started. The air supply is used throughout the process. So we have the fuel, which is the coal tar. We have the heating element uh, to supply heat initially. Combustion pr uh, provides it after it's started. And the air supply supplies the oxygen. I'll press the video here and you can see the combustion reaction in action. Um, what you should be seeing on your screens, if it's working, you're not getting too much lag, is a band of purple light which is progressing up through uh, the contaminated soil pack. Uh, the band of uh, uh, purple light is the combustion reaction, and you'll see it's relatively narrow um, and uh, and moves relatively quickly throughout the uh, um, throughout the video. Now, this video has been accelerated 50 times, um, so obviously it goes a lot faster here than uh, what you see in the lab. Um, but it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to travel about 10 to 15 centimeters within a column experiment. So it's about a centimeter per minute is the rate of propagation, which is on the order of maybe a meter per day, give or take. Uh, and this slide shows photographs of what the soils typically look like when they come out of a column. On the left is the uh, material we put into the column, and on the right is a photograph of the soils after treatment. Um, this is an example of uh, the material we're actually treating at full scale uh, in New Jersey, and that's the subject of the case study I'll be talking about uh, momentarily. Uh, but this level of transformation is typical of these types of experiments and also typical of what we see in the field. So our solutions. Uh, we have two basic uh, modes of application, and that is STAR for in-situ applications and STAR-X for ex-situ applications. Uh, for the in-situ application, uh, we're going after the contaminants where they exist, so we have to go and find them and ap apply the elements of the combustion triangle to where the contaminants exist. And we do that by supplying heat and uh, air through wells, which are installed in a target treatment zone. The process works both above and below the water table. In fact, all the work we've done so far has been below the water table. Uh, so we're under fully saturated conditions, and yet we still have uh, energy enough in these compounds to maintain a smoldering combustion reaction. Uh, we can treat a range of different contaminants, but what we look for is typically high energy, low volatility compounds. So things like coal tars, creosotes, and petroleum hydrocarbons are ideal for the process. Uh, things like chlorinated solvents um, are, are trickier because they are highly volatile, and of course it's difficult to heat them up uh, because they tend to volatilize faster than we can heat them. Uh, to start a combustion reaction. So we typically want low volatility, um, high energy compounds. In the ex-situ process, the uh, requirements are pretty well the same, uh, except here we're doing everything above the ground. So we can see it, we know what we're putting into our system, we know what's coming out of it, we know exactly what's going on. Uh, we have two different ways of applying Star-X. We can use a reactor system, which is a fabricated uh, steel structure uh, with a small footprint which we can build. Uh, or we can do soil piles, which is a little bit of a, uh, a cheaper option, but of course has uh, some other drawbacks. For example, it typically uses a larger footprint in order to use a soil pile system. Uh, we use these, uh, these systems for excavated contaminated soils and sediments, but we can also use it to treat waste oils, tank bottom residuals, and lagoon sludges. So these are simply liquid organic wastes, not necessarily contaminated soils, uh, but these are liquid wastes that uh, don't uh, combust in a flaming combustion reaction on their own. However, if you take them and mix them with a porous matrix, for example, contaminated soil, um, you can establish the conditions where smoldering combustion will occur, and thus you can use these systems as a waste treatment technology for these types of liquid organic materials. Uh, here's a brief video uh, showing how we apply the uh, in situ star system. I'll just press play here, and hopefully the lag isn't too bad and I can keep up with it. Uh, you can see we have our uh, ignition well installed to our target treatment zone. This well is a two-inch well. It can be installed with standard construction techniques or it can be a direct push well. Um, it's a two-inch well. Uh, and in that well, we will install our heater. This is what's used for the initial ignition process. 
Uh, we also have subsurface, subsurface thermocouples in the ground which uh, uh, track combustion temperatures and tell us where the combustion front is and how quickly it's moving. And to get the process started, we start blowing air into the well past the heater which is operating. This carries hot air into the subsurface, raising the temperature of the contaminants to the ignition point. Once sufficient heat mass has actually entered the subsurface, we'll start to see combustion gases in our collected vapors at ground surface, CO and CO2. This tells us that combustion is occurring, and we can turn off our heating element because we know there's an exothermic reaction in the subsurface. At this point, all we're doing is blowing air into the subsurface. The heater's off, and we're simply blowing air into the ground, and our combustion reaction will propagate away from our point of ignition out towards a radius of influence. This radius of influence is typically a site-specific parameter uh, and is uh, somewhat governed by the equipment we have above ground uh, to carry out the process. Now, the above ground equipment we have is very similar to what you would see with an air sparge FVE system. We have compressors for air supply, and we have blowers to exert a vacuum on uh, shallow soil vapor extraction wells to collect our combustion gases. Uh, we typically collect CO and CO2 and measure these gases to estimate how much mass we are destroying in the subsurface. Our ex situ system is very simple. Whoops, jumped ahead too many for me. Hold on a second. Our ex situ system uh, uses a lot of the same ancillary equipment as we have for our in situ process. We have compressors for air delivery. We have blowers for vapor extraction. We have some sort of vapor treatment system, activated carbon or a thermal oxidizer, standard uh, typical uh, remediation equipment. Uh, but instead of doing things below the ground here, we're doing it in a reactor. So this is a cylindrical column. Uh, which is filled with our contaminated soils. We have a heating element at the base and an air supply at the base, and we typically smolder uh, vertically upwards through our column, treating the soils uh, and removing clean soils from this vessel once the combustion reaction is complete. The soil pile system is a little bit different. As I uh, mentioned, we have a bit of a larger footprint, um, so we're using uh, larger equipment to move dirt around. This is when we have large stockpiles of contaminated soils. But again, the principles are the same. We have compressors, blowers, vapor treatment systems. We're burning vertically upwards. And the nice thing about these systems is you can get through large volumes relatively quickly, but also uh, you can see exactly what you're accomplishing. It's not as mysterious as what you have with an in-situ application. Uh, your soils are right there in front of you and you know exactly what you're treating uh, and what needs to be treated. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit uh, more detail about StarX uh, and the development work we've done uh, with our partner in the oil and gas industry, uh, looking at reactor and soil pile systems. Most of the work we've done to date has been with reactors, but uh, we've started to do some more work recently with soil piles. Uh, the uh, image in the bottom right should be familiar to all of you. If it's not, I'm a little concerned. Um, the subject site is a couple islands off the west coast of um, Australia, Barrow and Thevenard Island. Uh, here there's actually uh, two issues we're trying to deal with. One, there's uh, some land farm soil. So these are soils which have low levels of petroleum hydrocarbons which are sitting in the landfill basically not doing anything. Um, and then there's tank bottom residuals, so there's a liquid organic waste. Um, these land farm soils are contaminated, but not at a level where you typically look at doing a smoldering combustion reaction. However, if you take those land farm, uh, land farm soils and mix them with tank bottom residuals, you can uh, establish a mixture which is ideal for smoldering combustion. And you can actually solve two problems at once. We can clean up the soils and also destroy these tank bottom residuals so they don't have to be disposed in a different manner. As I said, we did a lot of development work uh, for this project. Uh, this is a photograph showing a couple of our reactor systems. The one on the left is what we call our intermediate scale reactor, and the one on the right is what we call our prototype reactor. The one on the right stands uh, uh, approximately seven meters tall from the ground to the very top. Uh, the actual uh, reactor volume where uh, all the good stuff happens is three meters tall uh, by one meter in diameter. It uh, has a heating element air supply at the bottom, and just like the schematic I showed earlier, we can bust vertically up, uh, upwards through this reactor system. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work with these systems over the past 11 years, and this is, or, sorry, not the past 11 years, since 2011, so the past four years or so. Uh, and what we're typically doing is uh, taking soils like we have on the left and making them look like they are on the right here. Um, this was uh, from one of our early tests where we simply took a coarse sand of our choosing and mixed them with the tank bottom residuals to a high concentration level. You can see the total petroleum hydrocarbon concentration is up around 137 milligrams per kilogram. We threw it in the reactor and afterwards the concentrations are non-detect. So this, this demonstrates really the waste treatment uh, version of the technology where we're getting rid of things like tank bottom residuals and uh, lagoon sledges. Of course, we're doing this at a relatively large scale, so the volume of clean soils after treatment is a little bit larger uh, than, uh, than uh, um, some of our other uh, lab-based experiments that we conduct. One of the key findings from this work uh, is demonstrated here in this plot, and uh, please excuse the units on the horizontal axis, uh, airflow rate per mass of oil. Um, it's a, uh, this graph is basically an interesting way of, of saying that there's a relationship between how hard you blow the air and how much mass of contaminants you put in the reactor in the first place. Uh, it's pretty intuitive, but the more mass you have in the system, the longer it takes to burn. Um, if you have a larger piece of wood, it'll take longer to burn than a small piece of wood. Same principle here. Uh, but also, the more air that you blow into the system, the faster it will burn. So we have a throttle, essentially. We have the ability to control the rate of combustion. There's a variety of reasons why we might want to burn quickly or might want to burn a, a little bit slower. Uh, we've done some more recent work on soil pile systems. Um, this is a photograph here showing the construction of a prototype soil pile system. Um, and you see here, it's basically a plenum space with a screen. Uh, this is the base where the contaminated soils go. It's not a very sophisticated system, and that's really the whole point of this. We want something very simple and cheap that can be dismantled and shipped from place to place and used in a variety of locations. Um, this is a, a very attractive option for our partners on this project. By the way, this is a, we're working with Chevron uh, on this ex situ work. Uh, we've been working with them uh, uh, in, uh, since about 2011, we've been working very well together to develop both the reactor and the soil power systems. Uh, a few photographs now showing um, the uh, most recent test we did. This is with our prototype soil power system. You can see some photographs here where we're loading soils onto this system. Uh, you can see the, obviously it's uh, impacted with uh, petroleum hydrocarbons here, that's the black color. Uh, we ran the test and everything went very, very smoothly, uh, and afterwards uh, we started excavating soil starting from the top and moving downwards. So this is a, 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 a series of images taken uh, looking down from the top, uh, starting at the very top of the soil pile. This next slide shows the excavation depth, which is uh, 30 centimeters up from the base of the soil pile. second one, which is 20 centimeters up from the base. So this is right in the heart of contamination. So you can see that uh, we're getting very, very good treatment. The soils went in black here, and obviously they've been significantly uh, remediated by the process. Another photograph here, now 10 centimeters off the base of a reactor. Again, soils are very, very clean. So some other projects we're working on, uh, obviously we're doing um, a lot of work with tank bottoms. Uh, we're looking to do a large scale uh, soil pile demo um, in the very near future. Um, we're looking at these mixtures of uh, tank bottom residuals and hydrocarbon impacted soils. Uh, we're looking at some other uh, uh, hydrocarbon impacted soils at uh, some other sites and some other locations around the world. And we've also been looking at some flare put soils as well. So from upstream oil and gas, uh, some of the soils left over from exploration wells. All right, let's move on to STARS. So this is the in-situ application, uh, and I'll talk to you about a um, project we're carrying out in New Jersey. 
Um, this is an aerial photograph of the site here. It's a 15 hectare former manufacturing facility in Newark, New Jersey. Um, the site is highlighted in white and we're looking east towards the Passaic River. Uh, the contaminant here is coal tar. They basically took uh, coal tar from manufactured gas plants and repurposed it, uh, creating cresol and other chemicals and using it for road tars and things of that nature. Um, most of the coal tar is located on the western property boundary in a series of lagoons that ran along the western property boundary, uh, but it did sink below the, the lagoons as well. Uh, and in total, there's about 42,000 cubic meters of uh, coal tar impacted soils at the site. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a cross section showing the geology of the site. Um, there are three main units of interest for us. Uh, the, the surficial unit is a fill. Uh, it's approximately 10 feet thick or about three to three and a half meters thick uh, right at ground surface. This is underlain by a PD clay, uh, which they call the metal mat in New Jersey. This was long thought to be a vertical barrier to denapple migration, but of course, in the creation of the lagoons, they actually excavated the metal mat where it was thinnest, creating an open, cha an open channel between the surf surficial fill unit and the fine sand unit, which is underlying the metal mat. Um, so as you can see in this next slide, the contamination is in the surficial fill, primarily associated with lagoons, and then it's also below the metal mat in that fine sand unit to a depth of about 10 to 12 meters below ground surface within that fine sand. So this, uh, is our, this project, uh, we're currently doing full-scale remediation at this site, but it was actually the first uh, uh, site that we uh, did field work at. So this uh, was the first opportunity we had to go out of the lab and do some experiments in the field, so we did a lot of technology development at this site. Uh, hence, we had a number of different phases of pilot testing that were conducted here. Uh, phase one and two were focused primarily on the shallow fill unit. Uh, we worked in a uh, six by 18 meter pilot test area. You can see a photograph of that on the, on the left hand side, the upper left of this slide. Um, this was all in the surficial fill unit, so it was all within the top 10 feet of contaminated soils. And we were basically playing in a sandbox. Uh, we installed a sheet pile down to the metal mat and keyed it into the metal mat in this location so that we uh, had a nice contained system with which to, to uh, study the process. Uh, for phase three, uh, we focused primarily on the deep sand unit. So here we're eight meters below the water table. There is no sheet pile, and essentially we're operating as we would uh, under full scale implementation conditions. So there's no uh, barrier or no way in which we're preventing groundwater flow, so it's fully saturated conditions eight meters below the water table. Uh, I'm going to focus primarily on the phase three work just now, just a, a quick uh, overview of what we did in the phase uh, one and two work. So in that shallow fill sandbox uh, that we created, we destroyed about four and a half tons of coal tar. Um, and in one burn in particular, we were destroying coal tar at a rate of 800 kilograms per day. Now that's all self-sustained smoldering combustion, so that's all uh, mass destruction carried out by blowing air into the subsurface following ignition. So the ignition took about 90 minutes in that uh, particular test, and we burned for about 11 days, uh, and so it had some very high mass destruction rates, at one point up to 800 kilograms per day, all supported through air injection in a single well. Uh, you can see some of the soil concentrations on the right-hand side, uh, the concentrations before treatment and after treatment. That was based on an uh, average of 15 before samples and an average of 8 samples. And there's a little photograph at the bottom of the slide which shows the transformation of soils before and after treatment. Uh, the transformation is very similar to what we typically see um, when we, uh, what we typically see in the laboratory and at other scales as well. So it's encouraging to see and in our in-situ application, we get similar levels of treatment. Uh, moving on to the phase three work, which is a little bit more interesting here. We're in the deep sand unit. It's a fine sand. Um, we're down uh, in this particular test at a depth of approximately eight to nine meters below ground surface, uh, which is about seven or eight meters below the water table. The water table is quite shallow at this, uh, at this site. And you can see there's plenty of coal tire impacting these soils down at that depth. 
Uh, I'm going to show you a series of slides um, which look something like this. This is basically a, a plan view map showing our thermocouple network. These little black dots are the locations of multi-level thermocouple bundles. So we have a thermocouple bundle right at our ignition point at the center, uh, another one at 0 0.3, 0 0.6, 1.5, and 3.5 meters away from the point of ignition in each of the four directions of the compass, so north, south, east, and west. Uh, the scale on this is uh, given in feet, um, but it's, uh, it's 8 meters by 8 meters, if I've done my math correctly. Um, so you get a sense of scale there. Uh, what I'm going to show you on these slides is cumulative peak temperature uh, within the deep sand target treatment inter inter interval. So this is day 6. What this is showing is the peak temperature recorded at any thermocouple up until day six. And what it actually does is define our treatment zone. So anything with sort of a warm color is telling us that we've had a smoldering combustion reaction there and the soils are treated. The numbers on these contours are temperatures in degrees Celsius. So this one's 450 degrees Celsius. Now this is cumulative peak temperature and that's different from the instantaneous temperature on day six, which looks uh, a little bit more like this. This is our daily max temperature. So this is the maximum temperature recorded on day six only, and what you can see is that the high temperatures are forming sort of a halo around our point of ignition. So right at the center of our, our, our uh, plot, we have uh, low temperatures right at our well point. We have high temperatures right where the combustion reaction is occurring. That's at about five feet uh, away from our point of ignition on day six, uh, and also low temperatures uh, where we haven't yet combusted. And this is a typical pattern we see with our combustion reaction where we have low, temp low temperatures in advance of our combustion front, very high temperatures where we're combusting, and low temperatures at the well point and behind the combustion front. And this is because we're always blowing air from our well to the combustion reaction, and the reaction is moving away from our well point. So the air we're injecting is actively picking up heat off the soils that have been treated and redepositing them into materials that have yet to be combusted. This is the recycling of heat energy, which has allowed the process to be self-sustaining and which enables STAR uh, to have all the uh, advantages um, as an exothermic uh, reaction. But we like to show the cumulative peak temperature because it better defines the treatment zone, and that's what you can see here on day six. And notice the pattern of propagation is quite uniform uh, by day six, uh, where we had steady propagation in all four directions at a relatively uh, even pace in all directions. Uh, by day 11, which is the next image you see, uh, there's a slight asymmetry to the uh, treatment zone. We're starting to favor combustion towards the west here, and again, that reflects the natural heterogeneities in the soil. Um, by day 11, we had confirmed te temperatures out at our, um, uh, our three-meter thermocouple, so, uh, sorry, our four-meter thermocouple, I believe it is, um, which was the extent of our monitoring network, so that defined the end of the test. Uh, a few photographs, hopefully you can see these okay on your screens. Uh, the soils again look very similar to what we see in the lab. Um, as stark transformation in the quality of soils before and after treatment. A little map in the upper right hand corner which shows um, the uh, uh, treatment zone from the thermocouple data uh, and a little Excel up here showing where the sample was collected from. So this first example was from a thermocouple about uh, one and a half to two meters to the north of our point of ignition. Those are very, very clean. Uh, you can see they've been uh, transformed significantly by the process. Uh, here's a second example, about um, uh, four meters to the west of our point of ignition. Uh, it essentially looks like beach sand at this point, um, where it's uh, very, very clean. And a third example, uh, just uh, about a half a meter or so away from our point of ignition. Looking at some of the statistics, um, we had, uh, you can see the soil concentration reductions in the little table on the right-hand side. Uh, what we're being asked to do at this site is to remove NAPL to the extent practicable, so we're not looking at soil concentrations per se as a remediation standard, but this gives you a sense of the level of treatment that uh, was accomplished during this test. The radius of influence, or ROI, for this particular test was on the order of three to three and a half meters. Uh, we had a propagation rate of about one meter per day, and we were targeting a two meter thickness of coal tar and estimated based on combustion gas concentrations that we destroyed 800 kilograms of coal tar um, within that uh, target treatment zone.
Now let's move on to our uh, full-scale design strategy. Now as I mentioned, there's two primary uh, layers of concern for us. There's the shallow fill and the deep uh, sand. Uh, this map here is a plan view showing the uh, ignition points for our shallow fill unit. The grid on here is a 100-foot grid, uh, so about 30, 35 meters or so uh, to a size to get, give you a sense of scale. And there are many uh, blue dots on this uh, slide showing the locations of the shallow field ignition points. There's actually 1,700 ignition locations uh, separated by about three meters. Uh, for the deep sand unit, there's about 300 wells, uh, and they have a separation distance of about six meters, so it's not quite as cluttered as you can see on this, uh, this image here. So overall, there's about 2,000 wells, uh, and to operate this system, we've clustered our wells into different groups, and the size of these, this clustering is dictated by the utility requirements, the airflow and electrical requirements, um, and the availability of these utilities at the site. So for the shallow fill unit, we're going to be operating 20 wells at a time, so we have 20 well cells. Well, we cell is basically an operating unit. In the deep sand unit, we have six well cells. Uh, the other uh, way we uh, group our, our uh, system is to actually have nodes as well. So we have wells, which, which are the individual ignition points, cells, which are the groups of wells which are operated simultaneously, and then we have nodes, and these are locations where we're parking our treatment system. Uh, for example, this little rectangle here is location of node 3. Uh, from node 3, our treatment system can reach out uh, 200 feet in all directions and treat all the wells within that radius. Um, once all the wells within that radius have been treated, we'll actually pick up our treatment system and move it on to the next node, um, and away we go. Now, 2,000 ignition points is a lot of wells, and certainly we don't want to install 2,000 well points and then go out and light them all uh, uh, after they're all in place. Uh, two reasons for that. One, uh, certainly it would be very expensive to install that kind of infrastructure to install 2,000 well points in the ground. And also it would take a long time to install them all, and we don't want to wait around while they're being installed before we can start remediating. So what we're actually doing is uh, drilling and installing wells and operating it uh, simultaneously, and how it works like this. On any given day, uh, we will have just completed uh, operating at a given cell. So 20 wells within the shallow fill unit, for example, will be complete, uh, they've been treated, and we'll be removing those wells from the subsurface for subsequent redeployment. Also on that day, we'll have another set of 20 wells, so another cell, uh, which is undergoing operation. So we're actively burning uh, at this location, we're actively blowing into the air into the ground and coal tar is being destroyed. Also on this day, we'll be installing a new set of 20 wells into the subsurface, getting ready for operation the next day. So for the shallow fill unit, we'll have 20 plus 20 plus 20 wells that are in play on any given day. Likewise, for the deep sand unit, we'll have 6 plus 6 plus 6 uh, wells that are in play on any given day. So overall, we have about 78 wells that we need to manage on a given day. And we'll use these 78 wells over and over and over again uh, to uh, uh, remediate at each of the 2,000 ignition points that we identified. Um, so uh, just to show you our system in action, this is uh, a still of the video I showed at the beginning of the presentation, which shows the target treatment zone, our well installed uh, to the target treatment zone, as well as the above ground equipment that we have. And I'll just run through showing you each of these bits of equipment uh, with photographs from this full-scale site. Uh, first things first, this is one of our in-well heaters. This is a portable heater, so again, uh, we don't need 2,000 of these things. We have a, a much smaller subset, and we reuse these heaters uh, at a variety of different locations uh, within our target treatment zone. Uh, this is what the well header looks like. Um, you can see the well going into the ground. Uh, coming out the top is the power supply for the heater, so this well actually has a heater in it and is ready to be turned on to start the process. We have our air supply coming in from the left, as you can see here, and on the right-hand side we have a, a, a pressure transducer to, to monitor wellhead pressure. Uh, this is our air manifold, so this is uh, part of our treatment trailer. Um, we have uh, an air manifold with, there's 10 stems on this side and 10 stems on the other side, so we can uh, operate 20 wells at a given time. Basically, this is just to direct airflow from our compressor systems to each of the wells that we're operating. 
Uh, stepping back a little bit, this is the treatment trailer. Again, you can see the, uh, the blue and yellow uh, manifold for the air supply. Just to the right of that, it's very small. I don't know if you can see it, but that's the uh, power supply outlets for the heaters. And these uh, yellow uh, lines coming in here are for our vapor collection system. I'll show that in a little bit more detail right here. There it is. Uh, so we have a manifold. This orange thing up on the trailer is our uh, vapor collection manifold. And we have eight legs running out the shallow soil vapor extraction systems. They come to this combined header uh, where we analyze our combustion gases and then send the combined flow out to our vapor treatment system. Uh, for this site, uh, there's, the, uh, there's the ducting going out to our recuperative thermal oxidizer, which is what we're using for vapor treatment. Uh, and there's a photograph of our RTO um, sitting on site right there. So as an overview, this is basically what a cell looks like. This is one of our deep cells. So we have six operating wells. Uh, we have a number of thermocouples installed into the ground. Actually, this thing here in the bottom left in the foreground here, one of our multi-level thermocouple bundles and the silver lines running back to this white trailer. Um, they're sending temperature data um, uh, for us to monitor the process and the propagation of the combustion reaction. Again, these yellow lines are vapor collection, so these uh, silver elbows here coming out of the ground are our shallow soil vapor extraction wells. A lot of what we do for this is actually managing air. We blow air into the ground, we collect air and treat it at ground surface. So most of what we're doing is managing air. And it's very similar to an air sparge SVE system. We just happen to have a combustion reaction in between the air sparge and the SVE. Okay. Moving on. Um, just to show you some of the results to date, this is an image showing the uh, well points and the cells within node three. So again, this little rectangle is where our vapor treat, or sorry, our treatment system sits. Uh, each of the dots is one of our ignition wells, and the blue and red lines circle the uh, wells that are clustered into a cell. So each grouping is a cell. The blue ones are uh, are cells that haven't been treated yet, but the red ones are ones that we have treated to date. Uh, so you can see we're starting to make progress on node three here. Um, one cell I want to point, uh, draw your attention to in particular is this one up here, cell three. This is one that we collected with, or we conducted with a lot of additional um, um, uh, data collection. So we have some good results from this uh, particular burn. And here's some photographs we'll just flip through showing the quality of the soils that have come out of cell three. All these soils beforehand were coated with coal tar and blackened and uh, obviously highly contaminated. The target treatment zone over here was approximately 10 feet thick, so we have uh, cores from 25 to 30 and also from 20, uh, 30 to 35 feet below ground surface. For this particular burn, uh, we estimated the amount of coal tar mass that was destroyed, and this estimate was made by collecting combustion gas data, CO and CO2, and basically adding up carbons and making some assumptions about the composition of coal tar. And we estimate that during this, uh, the burn at this cell, we destroyed about 10 tons of coal tar. Um, and that took about 10 days to complete. So that's six wells operating at a time, 10 tons in about 10 days. Uh, one other thing uh, that I want to touch on about the technology, uh, this is a carbon contribution network, which is a fancy way of uh, saying that this is sort of a look at the CO2 footprint of STAR versus some other technologies. Uh, on the left is STAR, uh, and it's being compared uh, for CO2 footprint versus low temperature thermal desorption, uh, and also versus excavation and off-site treatment, where that off-site treatment is thermal. Uh, you can see that the carbon footprint of STAR is about one-tenth that of low temperature thermal and excavation and, and off-site treatment, and that includes direct CO2 emissions from the combustion process itself. Uh, that ac accounts for half of the carbon footprint for, C uh, for STAR. Uh, some other STAR projects that we're working on, obviously, uh, we're going ahead with a uh, full-scale application at this site in New Jersey. Uh, we uh, seem to do a lot of work in the utility industry with manufactured gas plants or coke plants or things like that where we're dealing with coal tars. We did a couple pilot tests this past winter, one in Illinois and one in Michigan. 
Uh, we have a couple more projects uh, moving forward for this fall one, um, looking at a Navy special fuel oil at a Navy site in, uh, along the eastern seaboard in the United States. And also we're looking at uh, uh, treating diesel range organics at a formal refinery. Uh, and we have a number of other projects underway at various stages. Um, again, uh, we deal a lot with MGP sites as well, manufactured gas plant sites, as well as uh, from our coke plants and things like that. So in summary, uh, STAR is a robust process. It works both above and below the water table under fully saturated conditions. As you saw with that in-situ work, uh, all of that was below the water table. Um, as I mentioned, this is best suited for those uh, low volatility, high energy compounds such as coal tar, creosotes, and petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, we do apply this both in situ and ex situ. Um, the ex situ version can come in a, a variety of different uh, shapes and forms, uh, typically either in reactors or soil piles. Uh, one of the things that I didn't get into a lot here is that this technology uh, is backed by uh, nearly a decade of world-class research uh, looking at smoldering combustion. We enjoy a very healthy relationship with the inventors of the technology um, and the, uh, the primary researchers in this field. Um, so we have strong relationships with the University of Western Ontario in Canada, the Univers University of Queensland in Australia, the University of Strathclyde, and the University of Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, where they're doing a lot of research and have a very robust research program looking at smoldering combustion. Uh, and with that, I'll pause and uh, see if uh, Lang wants to uh, um, navigate through any questions for me, and I'll, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Thank you very much, Gavin. That was an excellent presentation. I'm just going to stop the screen share and get back so I can actually see the uh, chat functions and the like. Um, revoke all, bear with me for just one moment. Okay, and there we go. So thanks again, Gavin, that was very interesting and always exciting to see a new technology on the market and obviously some more opportunity to see, uh, get some detail on that one at CleanUp 2015 for anyone who's attending. Um, one question I see in the, well, I'll work through a couple of the questions uh, sitting in the public chat. Um, let me try to go from the top down. Um, okay, there's some audio ones. Dave Thomas. Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead and say who your industry partner is. So I think uh, Gavin. Yeah, I was a plug there. I, I apologize, I didn't. Um we, we've been working with Chevron now uh, since 2011 on the ex situ applications technology. I did think I mentioned it at one point during the talk, but yes, it's, uh, you can probably tell by looking at that map of Australia with Seven Art and Barrow Island that uh, we've been working with Chevron for, for quite some time here. That sounds good. Um, Jason Clay has a question about uh, the effect of star on the groundwater surrounding the Napple. Do you, have you, have you looked at treatment of groundwater contamination as sort of a, a residual effect of the of the star process. Right. Well, the star process is a source area remediation technology. So we're going after high concentration source areas. We're going after NAPL essentially. Um, I, I expect that at most sites and for most applications, star will be paired with some sort of groundwater remedy, typically monitored natural attenuation. Um, because it is essentially a source area technology, and that's pretty much the standard, where you remove the source area and there's got to be some sort of monitoring to, to, to follow up. Um, so we don't treat groundwater directly, but of course, if you're combusting the, uh, the, 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 uh, the NAPLE, then you're essentially removing the source to groundwater contamination, so there's obvious benefits there. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a source area technology. It is definitely not a groundwater treatment technology. Sure. And I guess uh, extending from that point, um, James Fairweather makes the comment, uh, would you design your remediation from outward, from outside in to avoid pushing contamination, if you will, uh, radially outwards from the treatment zone, or is that a con consideration or a concern? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, one of the things that we look at very closely is our implementation strategy and how we, we manage the fact that we're uh, injecting air into the subsurface and we don't want to move things around too much. Um, so yes, one of the ways we do that is by focusing on an outwards-in movement to uh, 
uh, to uh, basically, if anything's going to move, we want it to move where we're about to treat and not where we finished treating already. That's a very good point. Okay, we have a question. Oh, that's good. Jumped over one here. Sorry. Uh, Robin Madsen. Uh, do you experience ground subsidence post treatment as a result of the massive material destroyed or removed? Another good question. Um, we haven't seen it yet, but it is something that uh, we do consider to be possible. Uh, certainly, if there's any organic material that is part of the uh, geologic structure of the subsurface and it's removed, and it will be removed by a combustion process, then we would expect to see a uh, settlement or something uh, of that nature. Um, so if you have a very, very high natural organic content, uh, for example, a peat layer um, that you're targeting and you allow combustion to occur there and you remove it, and then obviously it's, it's no longer there and it was part of the geological structure and it's no longer there, then, then you could have some subsidence. Um, so it's, it's something that uh, um, we, uh, I personally don't do this, but we uh, typically get a geotechnical assessment uh, to look at uh, the possibility of this occurring. Um, so it's, it's certainly a possibility. We just haven't observed it yet, but it is something that goes into our, our, our design planning. Sure. Okay. Uh, a question from Ian Gregson. How effective is the in-situ process at chasing out ganglia of d -Napple? So if you've, you know, if you have gaps per se, or a discontinuous mm -hmm. distribution? Uh, that's a great question, um, and it's one that uh, we've been trying to answer for some time. I, I guess there's two ways to look at it. The first way is um, the STAR process basically removes the, uh, the groundwater and the contaminant from the pore space wherever the combustion reaction occurs. So if you happen to have a finger of napple, for example, um, and you remove the water and the napple from it, then it becomes a preferential flow pathway, and, and you'll generally start to see the combustion reaction favoring that pathway. So there is the possibility that you can basically follow little stringers away from your point of ignition, um, assuming you find them in the first place. Uh, and so in a way, it's, it's sort of a self-tracking process. Um, the the napple's probably in a stringer that uh, has some sort of preferential flow for the napple, and now you're actually exaggerating that by combusting the material there and removing water and napple from that stringer. So uh, you can have some uh, preferential propagation along uh, those little pathways and chase out ganglia, um, as Ian suggests. Um, the other thing, though, is we're, we're actually looking at this in a little bit more detail. We're in the midst of conducting a, a study with the U.S. EPA, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, um, and Battelle, uh, looking at um, heterogeneities and how the combustion reaction propagates in heterogeneous environments. So we're looking at two things in, in particular. One is finger thickness. Um, what uh, size finger is required to, care, uh, to maintain a self-sustaining combustion reaction. If the ganglia gets too small, then there won't be enough energy there to actually maintain the combustion reaction. Um, but if it's on the order of a few centimeters or so, then it can actually maintain the combustion reaction, and fingers that are relatively small can be treated with this process. The other aspect we're looking at is gap jumping, which is something that Lang mentioned. Uh, and that is when you have breaks in contamination and if you can leap across those by transferring heat across clean zones and picking up the combustion reaction on the far side. So uh, we're doing a lot of work actually studying this um, with our university partners to look at it in more detail. Um, so that's uh, another way of uh, sort of answering that question. Sure. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions from uh, Peter Grin Gringinger. Um, any issues based on limitations based on soil type, so sands versus clays. Absolutely. Um, so obviously we, uh, our process requires us to deliver an oxidant to the combustion reaction. Um, and so we need to have a, a material that's permeable enough to, to allow us to do that. Um, we typically burn quite well in anything from sort of silty sands to gravels. Um, if we get into clays, then it's simply too fine. Hopefully there's not a lot of napple in the clay in the first place. Uh, but if there is a uh, clay, then uh, it limits our ability to inject air, and we can't combust in clay. So anything that's finer than a than a, a silty sand or a silt or whatnot, then then that that's not that's not the safe for star. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, um, we do need a porous matrix. We do need to have um, a situation where smoldering combustion can occur. So if we have uh, materials that are too large, um, I guess an extreme would be a karst, for example. 
then we're going to have large void spaces and large open spaces where we simply don't have the ability to maintain a smoldering combustion reaction. We lose heat, groundwater sloshes around, taking heat out of the system, and, and things just generally don't burn in that manner. Um, so we, we put an upper limit on it as well. Um, we can't do clays, they're too fine, and uh, we typically uh, burn up to gravels or, or small cobbles in that sort of range. Okay, sounds good. Uh, related to that, another question from Peter. What natural saturation levels would be the lower limit for smoldering to work? Another excellent question. Um, this uh, can vary by compound. Uh, it certainly does vary by compound. For the, the, the compounds that we typically deal with, which are coal tars and creosotes, um, and some of the heavier petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, we typically look at total petroleum hydrocarbon concentrations, and we want to see concentrations on the order of about uh, three to 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. Um, which is lower, lower than what you typically call a, an apple source area, I would think. Um, so there is a minimum concentration. If we go below that, we can burn it. It will combust, but it won't combust in a self-sustaining manner. You need that minimum concentration of about 5,000 milligrams per kilogram TPH so that the material will give off enough heat that the combustion reaction will maintain itself as long as you keep blowing air into the subsurface. Um, so that's a key number. Um, for other compounds, for light end hydrocarbons like diesels, it's going to be higher than that. But for coal tars, creosotes, and some of the heavier hydrocarbons, that's typically the, the number, about 5,000 milligrams per kilogram TPH. Okay. Uh, a question from Norel Simmons. What's the smallest operational working footprint required to operate a system? We have limited space due to our active operations. Right. Um, well, I think you saw from that photograph I presented of our operational system the uh, the size of the equipment we typically use. Now, that's a wide open site, so we weren't trying to make anything compact there. Um, we obviously uh, we need access for our rigs. We need to install wells. We need to install thermocouples, so we need to be able to drive a rig around. Um, and then most of what we have after that is various lines and piping and ducting and whatever moving from our wells to a treatment trailer, and that that can go to... Um, uh, pretty much anywhere it needs to be, we can run our lines. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little difficult to answer that question because the size of the equipment as well is going to be dictated by the, um, by the number of wells you're operating at a time. For example, the, in that photograph, uh, we're set up to be blowing 1,000 SCFM into the ground and to be extracting 3,000 SCFM out of the ground. And that's because we're trying to burn as many wells as we can at a given time. But if we did it one well at a time, we'd have much, much smaller equipment that we'll be using, and it wouldn't take up nearly the, the same footprint uh, that the system you saw uh, does. Um, so it does vary uh, on, on how we want to operate the system. Um, but um, I, I, hopefully you saw from those photographs the size of equipment that we typically use without constraints. And if there are constraints, we'd have to find a way to work around that. Sure. Okay. Question from Ben Schultz. Um, do you generate undesirable chemicals as a result of combustion, such as dioxins? Uh, that's another good question. Um, we, in order to generate dioxins, you need to be operating at the right temperatures. You need to have the right chlorinated precursors in order to create those types of things. Um, again, looking primarily at coal tars and creosotes, we simply don't have the right compounds present in order to, to, uh, to create dioxins and ferrons. We actually uh, conducted a study with, uh, again, the U.S. EPA, uh, as well as Patel, um, looking at the treatment of a creosote that had uh, about 50% uh, um, uh, polychlorinated biphenols. Or no, what, no, sorry, what do we have? Um, that's not what it was. Uh, pentachlorophenols, that's what we have in grand creosotes, pentachlorophenols. Um, so there were chlorinated compounds, not necessarily what you'd expect to be the precursors for dioxins and furans, but what we did was conducted a study to look specifically for their formation. Um, and what Battelle concluded from that was that um, the concentrations of dioxins and furans in the soil after treatment were actually lower than what were there beforehand, before STAR was even involved or any heating had taken place. Uh, so the concentrations were lower and they didn't detect them in the vapors that were collected. So uh, it, it's unlikely that they're formed. Um, and certainly the temperatures we typically deal with are in the range that are, are, are high enough to actually destroy these compounds typically. 
Um, so I, I won't say that it's impossible, uh, and I think if we tried to treat certain, uh, you know, uh, pesticides or something like that, there'd be a possibility for it. Uh, but for the compounds that we're typically looking at, coal tar, cruciferous, petroleum hydrocarbons, um, it's very unlikely to happen, and we certainly haven't seen it thus far. Sure. Uh, another question from Peter. Would you avoid using it in or close to coal seams? And I guess for context, there was in the news um, in Victoria uh, that there was issues with uncontrolled um, coal seam fires uh, affecting um, certain areas, and you know something that you know, a lot of public awareness and concern about. Right, that's a good question. Um, certainly, uh, um, overcoming uh, concerns of the public in a situation like that is going to be a challenge. Um, you know, I guess the, the primary difference between those situations and ours is that we're doing this on purpose and, and, and we're, we're igniting intentionally and we have the ability to monitor and control. And one of the things we do or can do is actually isolate our treatment zone and put physical barriers in place, for example, a slurry wall or a sheet pile or something to actually prevent the combustion reaction from moving beyond where we want it to occur. Um, we do have the ability to, to absolutely control the process with our airflow. Um, certainly turning off the air uh, turns off the supply of oxygen, which can stop the reaction. And we're below the water table. Not only do we stop the reaction, but we stop putting pressure uh, on the groundwater in the subsurface, and it can come back in and actually uh, snuff out the reaction. The, the groundwater can flow back in and actually remove heat energy. Um, so you can remove two legs of the combustion triangle, both the oxygen and the heat, um, when you turn off your air supply below the water table. Um, so it's one of those situations that would obviously have to be looked at very, very carefully. Um, engineering controls can be put in place, um, but uh, I think it all comes down to proper design and understanding uh, where you're going to be operating in the subsurface. Sure. Okay. Uh, question from James Stenning. Have you evaluated connectivity of aquifers post-treatment? For example, if you had combusted PD material as part of the process that may have been acting as an aquitard between two layers. Um, no, we haven't. Uh, we haven't looked at that in any way. Um, I don't think. Well, certainly, if there's a, a, a PD layer which we allowed to combust, we would actually remove it. So I, uh, that would absolutely improve the connectivity between the layer above and below. Um, as far as the rest of the process goes, I mean, um, it's it's a bit of a hypothetical situation at this point. Um, you know, we'll, we'd be removing um, the organic material between the layers, but if it's a significant divide, a, a significant um, impediment to, uh, you know, hydraulic flow from one layer to the next, then it's likely to be of a fine gray nature and likely to be something that we can't combust in. Um, so if you have a clay layer in between um, two aquifers, for example, we're probably not going to combust in that layer or affect it in any way, shape, or form anyways. Um, if, it's a, if it's a peat, for example, and we do allow it to combust in that peat layer and we remove it, then I, I, certainly there would be some effect on the connectivity. Um, but I think that's a, that's a, a site-specific thing that we'd have to look at in more detail. But uh, um, it's certainly a possibility if uh, basically you need to remember essentially that what we're doing is we're removing organic matter with this process, whether it's natural or not. Sure. Okay. Uh, another question from Ian Gregson. In the exit shoe pile, was the black around the edge untreated residue? That was the sort of. Oh, and I see that. Uh, I see that Dave Thomas uh, followed up with an answer. Dave Thomas uh, is, uh, has been working with us on this project, so he knows it very, very well. Um, so he, uh, uh, his answer, if you can read that there, is, is absolutely correct. So basically what we did is we, we piled uh, the material on the screen and around it as well. So we weren't trying to keep it just above the screened area, but it also spilled out over the edges. Again, this is uh, all part of us um, seeing how much treatment we can get outside the screened edges and also uh, trying to make this, the system as simple as possible. This is not necessarily how we would operate at full scale, and we might uh, make other uh, choices as to how we uh, uh, apply our contaminated materials to the top of our soil pile system. But that was what you're looking at, essentially, that we had our uh, screened area where we had complete treatment where we were trying to treat, uh, and then there was a fringe around that where we weren't really trying to combust. Sure. Okay. Um, the million-dollar question from Emmy Lou Cook, what is an expected cost per cubic meter of treated soil? 
Okay. Um, well, for our ex situ, uh, for our in situ application, rather, um, this is where we have the most data on this sort of thing. Um, it's very difficult to give a unit cost, uh, particularly with uh, prices changing from location to location uh, for, uh, around the world. Um, what we typically do is compare our cost with other technologies that are typically used for the compounds that we're interested in, coal tars, creosotes, petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, and, and again, there's tons of caveats you can put on this because uh, obviously there's going to be some situations where digging things out of the ground, if it's so shallow, is, is obviously the, 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 the way to go and things are going to be cheaper there. But I'd say for any, any application where you're looking at a site and you think, wouldn't it be nice to have an in situ remedy as opposed to digging this out of the ground? And that's where STAR might be applicable. Uh, and in those types of situations, we've found that the, the cost for uh, in situ treatment via STAR is about half the cost of what it is for excavation and disposal. Again, it's going to vary from location to location. Uh, different geographies are different. Um, but uh, certainly in, in the northeastern United States, where most of our experiences, we've found that to be true, that STAR is about 50% the cost of dig and haul. Um, if you're looking at in situ stabilization or solidification as an alternative, the costs there are a little bit closer. Uh, we think that STAR is probably about 75 to 80% of the cost of ISS. Uh, and then also if you're looking at an in situ thermal remedy, like a thermal desorption where it's an endothermic uh, remedy, what we typically look at is the cost for the electricity used in those systems. Because that's really the fundamental difference between the two, is that for in situ thermal desorption, you're basically pumping electricity in the ground for months on end. Whereas with our process, um, you know, we, 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 to get an ignition, it costs about 40 cents worth of electricity, this type of thing. So. Um, it's really the electrical demand which is the primary difference. Um, my research suggests that the electrical component uh, of the cost is about 30% of the overall cost for in situ thermal desorption, but I've heard that can vary a lot, um, and in some cases it can be a lot more than that. So typically we say it's on the order of about the, uh, the cost of STAR is about 75% or so of, of in situ thermal desorption. Okay, it looks like we have one last question. Thanks everyone for your interest in hanging in there. Um, from Ian Gregson, what level of site characterization is typically required prior to in situ STAR? And I guess for a little hmm. bit of context, we, I believe right now the first project to use a, a Targost um, direct push tool system uh, is currently underway in Australia. We haven't actually had the equipment in Australia that would be typically used for that High resolution characterization of coal tar dean apples. Um, what what would what would be your thoughts on that? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I wasn't aware, but uh, I was going to bring up Targos, the Tar Green Optical Screening Tool uh, from the Go to Technologies, at least in North America, um, which is an excellent tool uh, we found um, for helping design star systems in particular. Um, we can set up Targos grids to match our star grids so that we know exactly at each location where we're trying to burn at what depth we need to place our screen. Um, and it's quick and it's relatively inexpensive and I think it's a fantastic tool. Uh, we're actually using it um, as part of our full scale uh, remedy out in New Jersey uh, where we're using it uh, for both uh, pre and post characterization. Uh, we're just starting to get into that a little bit more. Um, I think that's a terrific tool. Uh, in general, it's, I guess it's sort of a philosophical question. Uh, the more site characterization, the better. Um, uh, and you can say that about any in situ remedy. Uh, the key for us is we, we simply need to know where to put our ignition well. Uh, what happens outside the ignition well is like what happens with every in situ remedy. Um, you can monitor and you try and monitor the best of your ability, uh, but you only know where you've actually, uh, what's going on in places where you've actually poked a hole. Um, so for us, uh, it's about uh, understanding the target treatment zone and really where to place the screen. Uh, if you have like a, a, a clay aquitard or something, which is a bottom boundary, uh, then it becomes very simple to place your screen. But if you're at like our site in New Jersey where we have a fine sand and there's very subtle differences in the geology which are dictating the, the, the layering of the coal tar, then we need something like a targos to tell us where it is uh, so that we can put our screen in the right place. Hope that answers the question. Okay, well, uh, we're, we're about 20 minutes over, which is fantastic that there's this much interest and people have sort of hung in. And uh, thanks very much, Gavin, since it's 
pushing uh, 1030 p.m. your time. Um, I will follow up this webinar with an email to everyone who's registered. So if you do have additional questions, you are more than welcome to uh, send them through. We'd be happy to respond. Uh, I guess for the sake of everyone uh, getting to lunch or to the next meeting, um, we might wrap it up here. But uh, Gavin, thanks again for your time. Really great presentation. Obviously, with the number of questions, I think that's the record number of questions we've had uh, from one of our webinars, and also the the highest uh, registration we've had. So um, certainly some interest, uh, as there would be with a with new technology. And um, thanks again. And uh, anyone who's interested in attending Cleanup 2015, please feel free to come call into the booth, have a chat with uh, Dave Major, and uh, I'm sure we could give you some more information. Great. Thank you very much, Lang, and thank you all for your attention.